So I want to circle back here and spend a little bit of time talking again about autobiographical memories. Now we know that memories from your own life are multimodal, they can be sound-based, hearing-based, smell-based, taste-based, taste all of that. But what part of the brain is involved in these episodic or autobiographical memories? Well, researchers at Duke University designed a really elegant study to answer just that question. They got a group of 12 Duke University undergraduates and had them go around campus and take pictures of 40 different buildings and well-known locations on campus. And then all the students came back into the lab and they got everyone's pictures together. For each subject later in an fMRI study, they would look at pictures that they had taken and pictures that other people had taken, but it's gonna be of the same buildings and things. So that the buildings and statues and fountains will all be the same. The only thing that differs is, is that a picture that you took or a picture that someone else took? And what they found is two brain areas show differences in activity when you're looking at pictures that you took versus pictures that someone else took. In other words, pictures that you took, those are episodic memories, right? They're, they're, they're pulling up a memory of something that you yourself did. The pictures that other people took, you weren't there, you don't know who they are, you know what the building is, but you don't, it's not, you're not looking at a picture of your experience being at that building. Okay, what are the two brain areas? The first one is a prefrontal cortex. And if you can see these two lines here, there's a gap between them. That shows you that one type of brain activity is bigger than another. Um, and basically the yellow line on top, that gr shows greater activity in your prefrontal cortex when you are looking at pictures that you yourself took of these, in, uh, took of these landmarks at Duke University. Over in the hippocampus, there's also another place where, um, right here, where the yellow line is above the uh, blue-green line. Um, that shows you that the hippocampus is more active when you are looking at pictures that you took. In other words, retrieving episodic memories. So the two areas that are involved in episodic memories, as far as we know, are the pre prefrontal cortex, which contains information about yourself, and the hippocampus, which we know is important in recalling memories. Okay, the second thing I wanted to tell you about is I wanted to circle back and talk again about the reminiscence bump. Remember that phenomenon? When you look back at your life, say you're retired, and you look back at your life, what will you remember? And it turns out that you will remember a lot that happened between the ages of about 15 and 25, or 10 and 30, depending on what your cutoff is. And the question is, why? Why does a reminiscence bump exist? We're gonna talk about three hypotheses. Um, they're not mutually exclusive, all three can be correct, and current research suggests that all three do describe different aspects of the reminiscence bump. These are self-image creation, better cognitive encoding, and a cultural life script. So what do I mean by each of those? Um, when you're a young person, when you're in your teens, in your early 20s, a lot of what you're doing is figuring out who you are. Uh, you can describe who you are with I statements. So for example, this is a, a sad person who feels like they're not, I'm not worthy, I must be perfect, I must not make a mistake, I'm not good enough. Okay, these are aspects of that particular person's self-image. Um, self-image is established, not completely, but most of it is established when we are in adolescence and young adulthood and so maybe that's why the reminiscence bump exists. The second one, uh, I think if you, have, if you are an immigrant or there's immigrants in your family, you're really gonna find this interesting. It's a cognitive explanation. Encoding is better during periods with a lot of change, a lot of events going on, followed by stability, okay? And it turns out 
that researchers conducted really cool analyses of the reminiscence bump as a function of when people emigrated to the US. And if people emigrated early in their life, then they would show the reminiscence bump early where uh, non-immigrants tend to show it. But if they emigrated later in their life, say between the ages of 34, 35, then their reminiscence bump occurs later. Yeah. Because when you emigrate to a new country, you know, ah, everything is changing. Everything is different. It's an incredibly active time in your life. And then you start to get settled, right? Yeah, it's cool. The third explanation of the reminiscence bump is something called cultural life scripts. Um, every person has their own personal story, but they also have an understanding from their culture of what is expected the, of them when in life. So some, some cultures want people to marry early and have children early. Other cultures say, no, get married later and have kids even later than that. So different cultures set up different expectations for all of us. It turns out that you are best at remembering the actions from your life that are consistent with your culture's expectations. A lot of cultures place a lot of expectations on people when, when they're in their late teens and early 20s. So those are three reasons that psychologists think that the reminiscence bump exists. And that closes out my discussion on autobiographical memory. The next lecture that we have, it's going to be on cognitive psychology and the law. I think it'll shake you up. So I'll see you then.